you will find today uh, that we do not have uh, feedback forms for uh, each of the sessions. We don't have you know, paper forms in the rooms. Um, it's not that we don't want feedback, it's just that we found that the paper forms um, aren't actually as effective as we'd like them to be. So uh, I'll tell you what, if you are um, on the core team for today's theme, if you're a, one of the Agile Lifecycle uh, core team members, can you stand up? That would be you. <laughs> okay. Uh, stay standing, sorry. Um, if you were involved in actually helping to uh, select the uh, sessions outside of uh, core team members, can you stand up? Okay, all right. So uh, we will have folks in each of the rooms. Um, you can approach any of them. Uh, also, take a look at these folks here. You can approach them. Um, and I will show you uh, a, a slide deck with uh, some of our other organizers uh, on it. Um, any of them are happy to take your feedback, um, and we will, you know, we'll incorporate all of that. Okay? Thanks. Are we set? Without any further uh, ado, um, I don't think there's a, a whole lot of introduction that's needed. I'm sure that most of you are very familiar with Ash and, uh, and his work. Um, as soon as we get up here, uh, you know, a, a leader in, in the lean and agile space um, has written a couple of uh, excellent books. If you have not read them, I do recommend that you do so. Um, and as soon as we've got this set, I will have him. I've got an adapter. Okay. All right. All right. Ash. Our best. <laughs> All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, how are you all doing? So I usually like to start this by getting a sense of who's in the room. So how many of you are somewhat familiar or quite familiar, it doesn't matter, with Lean Startup or Running Lean? Okay, so about, let's say about a third of you. That's, that's good. Um, so what I'm going to do today is really talk about, introduce kind of the, some of the Running Lean concepts. I know a lot of you have agile backgrounds, so we'll kind of tie the two things together and see how one uh, kind of stops at where the other one starts. But by way of introduction, I have kind of some books that I have written, and, and I've written one book and I'm writing a second book, but I often like to introduce myself first and foremost as a practicing entrepreneur. So I build products every day. I do come from a technical background. I've written code um, for as long as I know, and I still try to sneak it every now and then. It's harder these days, but um, that's, that's really what I do. So I'd like to start with the sad reality. So this is the, the, the unfortunate statistics, is that most products fail in general. So a lot of the lean startup really came out of the startup world, but we find the same level of uncertainty, the same level of failure rates in really any new product introduction. So this is not just limited or restricted to startups. Now, there was a study that was done in Silicon Valley that looked at startups that did fail, and what they found is that the number one cause for failure was not the lack of the ability of talent or skill or, or the ability to build the product. All these companies were well-funded. They had a business plan. They had a, a, a spec to go execute on, and they all build a product to spec, yet they still failed. And so that number one reason for failure was not because they failed to build the product they set out to build, but because they wasted needless time, money, and effort just building the wrong product entirely. They built the wrong product because they failed to find the right customers and markets for those products. And so if we kind of take a step back and see why this happens, the number one reason that I attribute for this failure is that we as entrepreneurs, as people building products, generally fall in love with a resolution. So when we get hit by an idea, we, we, we get this single clear uh, idea that comes in, in, in our heads, and this is a pyramid that I'm going to kind of build upon. At the very lowest layer in that idea is a vision, something we want to go do, something we want to go achieve. Then there's the strategy of how we go out and roll out this particular product or feature. And at the very top, we have the product. The mistake a lot of us make is we rush up this pyramid. So we go right to the product and fall in love with the final solution and then fail to really understand what the, uh, the, the right customers and markets are that we're, we're essentially going after. The second reason that I attribute to this, kind of this, this product development being hard or building the right products being hard, is that product development itself gets in the way of learning. Now, this one is a little counterintuitive, um, but if we go back to my earlier statement that the top reason why we fail is because we fail to find the right customers and markets, 
if we look at where we learn about customers and markets, they happen at the tail end of the product development cycle. So in the beginning, we go out and gather some requirements, and then when we release stuff out to them, that's when we learn whether what we built was good enough or it was, it was meeting the, the requirement. But there's this big middle where we go away for a long time. And I put very little learning, but I'll qualify that. We are learning a lot about product. We're learning about uh, quality. We're, we're building things per spec. But we're not really learning about customer interaction with those products. And that's one of the fundamental things that Lean tries to inject, or say the Lean startup tries to inject, is change this picture from being a product development life cycle and to being a continuous development life cycle with Customer feed, uh, with a customer feedback loop. The third thing that kind of I attribute to this failure is that we all know we need to listen to customers and we kind of pay lip service to this. So we go and gather requirements and we try to get feedback from them. But you really have to know how to listen to them. And for those of you that have ever tried to go and ask customers for requirements, you know that they're typically not as visionary as you are. Um, they, they typically do not do very well, I'm, and I'm, not, I'm generalizing here, but not every customer falls in that, in that category. But oftentimes, people will cite this code and say, it's useless to talk to customers because they can't tell me what to go build. They're not as visionary, or they, can't, they don't know the product as well as, as we do, because that's, that's what we build. And so they cite this code, the Henry Ford code, which if he had gone out and talked to customers, they would have told him not to go and build the automobile or mass produce the automobile, but build a faster horse. What we fail to realize is that even in that code, there is a gem of, of an information. And that is that the customers aren't really telling us what to go build. That's not really their job. And Steve Jobs said that really well. But he said it's not the customer's job to know what they want. That's really our jobs as the people who build the products. So we have to figure that out. So even in this code, there is a, there's a problem statement. What the customers are saying is that they are unhappy with their existing alternative which happens to be a horse, and the attribute they're most unhappy about is that it's slow. So had Henry Ford gone and invested in genetic engineering and actually literally built a faster horse, that would have been just as good of a solution. But he came up with the automobile and mass producing the automobile, and that solved the problem as well. So that's something to keep in mind, is that when we are talking to customers, the goal isn't to go and run surveys and features and get features from them, but really understand their current reality, really understand their current worldview, and then figure out the right solution to go build for them. And as we get deeper in this talk, you will kind of see some techniques for doing that. So how do we build these products that people actually do want, even though I just said you can't ask them if they want it or not? So I wouldn't be an entrepreneur if I didn't have at least one slide with my book on it. So this is uh, my shameless promotion. So there is a book that I've written that goes into lots of how-to details for doing a lot of the things that I'll talk about here today. But I am going to stay at a high level and really talk about three main topics. Um, so we're going to take each of these layers and start at a very macro level and see how you go about taking the vision that you have and how do you break that down? How do you then strategically go out and launch your product? And then we'll get down to some more feature development types of stuff. So I'll have a Kanban board and I'll walk, walk you through the, a typical product development cycle. So the first step here, when you're starting with a vision, when you're starting with an idea, is you have to document your, your idea down. And for a lot of us, when we look at the idea, we only look at the solution, we look at how we go build it, but there's a lot more to that. And the reason that this step is really important is that we are especially gifted, and I use the word entrepreneur, but I'm using that for anyone that's building products in, in the general sense, is that we're especially gifted at rationalizing anything in retrospect. So if we build something, and it doesn't work, well, it's usually because of some external condition. If we launched a product in the summer month and it doesn't sell as well or doesn't get used as well, it's obviously because everyone's on vacation. And then after the summer months, when it's still not selling or still not getting the traction we want, it's because, well, people are just coming back from vacation. Maybe their kids are going back to school. And then there's some festival or some holiday. So there's always something that you can attribute to, to, to things not working. And so we want to bring a more empirical sense to how we, how we do things, and so almost thinking like a scientist, where a lot of this stuff is based in the scientific method, is we want to bring some more objectivity. So we want to declare outcomes and then measure ourselves against it. So traditionally, we have used business plans for this, or a business case in a, in a company setting. So how many of you here have written a business plan before? Let me show of hands. I know it's not very popular these days. Um, so keep your hands up if you enjoy that process. So actually, there's one hand that stays up. So there's usually a few, there are a few people like that, that kind of torture that who keep their hands up. 
But the business planning process is a very painful exercise because a lot of what you're putting down there is you're trying to predict the future. You're really writing more works of fiction than, than fact. So it's really a lot of projections, a lot of numbers you're playing with to make the case look good. The, the, the sad reality with the business plan is that the people who make you write it don't read the whole thing themselves because they know it's not going to really work out that way. But they do want you to go through the exercise because that gets you out of just thinking of the solution and thinking of other things. So you can more critically explain what you're trying to do. And even though it's not going to come true that way, at least you've thought about it. So that's what the, the point of that exercise is. So you've done some planning. So no planning is, is not a good alternative either. If you, so I, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle ground. If you do too much planning or you do no planning, you're just as, you're, 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 it's just as bad. So there's a new alternative, and that is this idea of the one-page business model. So these investors don't, uh, these investors are, are people in the company that are holding the budgets, don't want to read the whole plan, but they want you to come in there and give them a condensed version of it. So they want you to give them the one-page executive summary or the 10-page slide deck. And so why don't we just start with something smaller? And that's where this idea of the one-page business model really comes from. It looks something like this. We're not going to walk through it today, but I just want to show it to you because it's got all the same elements that would go into a business plan but you can create this on a single page and you can use this to take your idea down and, and put it down on a piece of paper. When you show this to someone, they can't help but have an opinion and that's the most important thing because the idea of business planning is to really have conversations with people other than yourself because we can always convince ourselves we are right, but you want to have those conversations about what it is we're trying to build, what markets we're trying to go after, are we building the right features, are we building the right products. So this is that one page business model format. This is a lean canvas format. It is a derivative work off of the original business model canvas some of you may, have, may be familiar with. Now one of the things you'll notice here is that there is a solution box, but it's very, very small. And I did that intentionally. I wanted to add the solution box because as people who build products, that's the thing we identify with the most. It's also the thing we are most passionate about and the things we're best at. But it's also not, the, the reason I also made it very small is because that's the stuff we know how to do really well. The other stuff we don't know as well, and they're equally important. So the epiphany that I had, remember I, I was building products. I had products that were successful, products that weren't successful. But the epiphany that I had is that it wasn't about the quality of the software that I was actually putting out there. It was really that the product I was building wasn't just limited to the solution. I began to look at the entire business model as the product. And that was a big epiphany for me because it allowed me to apply the same techniques that I use for building products to building my business. And so I looked at the first step being something we would do if you're building a complex product, um, you would start by some kind of architecture document or you'd start with some kind, of, some kind of a blueprint. If you're building a house, you would start with an architecture blueprint. And that's what that one page business model is really about. It lets you model what you're going to do with this product uh, without spending too much time planning. The next principle also comes from the product development playbook. If you had six months to build a complex product, you wouldn't start with the simplest stuff first because we know that stuff we can do. So, that, uh, so what, what you really want to do is start with the more complex, the more risky stuff first so that by month five, you're not churning like crazy or thrashing like crazy. But when we build our, our products, we do the exact opposite. We start with the simple stuff. So we go and we build the features that we know and then we start tackling the more complex stuff, which is, in this case, sometimes the market risk and the customer risk much, much later. So that's something that needs to be reversed. So you have to identify what's riskiest, not necessarily what's easiest in this particular product when you're building it out. And then in the Lean Startup vocabulary, we have this concept of an experiment, and that is this build, measure, learn loop. I'll have a bigger picture here so you can see what it is. But the idea here is that you take your, your plan identify what's riskiest, it may be that you're, you're, you're building a new, a, a new feature or, or a new product and you're requiring people to pay. And traditionally, people haven't paid for this. So one of the things you may want to do is, for example, set up a landing page to see will people actually pay for this particular product. And even forget payment, you might even want to just test demand before you actually go and build this product out. So those are some of the things you can do through experiments. And I'll, as I said, I'll get into a little bit more detail when we, when we talk, uh, kind of talk more at the tactical level. But this picture shows you that high level flow of starting with your vision, kind of identifying what's riskiest in it, and then testing that before everything else through a series of experiments. So if we talk about the next phase here, which is how do we now go and roll out this, this product or how, what is the strategy for building it? 
if we look at the, um, the, the lean canvas or, or this, the, this one page business model here, I talked about identifying what's riskiest on it. And people usually ask me, where is the risk box? How do you identify what's riskiest? And the answer is that everything here is really a risk because everything here is mostly uncertain. We think we know who our customers are. We think we know what features they want, but that is not entirely fact yet until we go validate it. And so everything here is really a risk and we need to tackle them, but tackling them all at once is not an easy thing either. So we want to do this more systematically. And so I break the product development launch into a set of stages. So there's three stages that you, a typical product life cycle goes through. And we can take this from the macro level even down to building features and releases, which I'll talk about here in a second. But let's talk at the very high level. So when you have a new idea and you want to go implement it, the first stage is all about testing whether you have a problem worth solving in the first place. Not whether your solution is going to really solve a problem, but is this really a problem worth solving in the first place? And the trick here is that we can do this without building anything. We can do this without writing a single line of code. And the way that we do this is if we realize that customers don't really care about the code. They don't really care about our solution. They care about their problems. So if we start with that insight, we can build something that I call the offer. And the offer is typically made of three things. It's the unique value proposition. So that's the benefit the customer is going to get after they use your product or after they use your feature. So what is it that you're really solving for them? Are you helping them get, you know, be more productive? Are you helping them uh, make more money? So what is that unique value proposition that you can tie this product or feature to? Then what you can actually do is show them a demo of what you're doing. So without writing a single line of code, you're going to have to do this work anyways. You're going to have to design this feature out or this product out. But if you go and build a demo, you can articulate how you get the customer from their current reality, which is their point A, to where you want to get them, which is the point B. And we can do this again without writing any code. And then if there's a pricing conversation, that can also be had. Because at this point, your customers can see how you solve that particular problem for them. And you can do all these three things just through a casual conversation. This can be a face-to-face -face conversation. It can be done through tests online. So you can, if you look at the way we, we, we do crowdfunding campaigns, Kickstarter is an example of this, where you take a, a landing page, you put up a value proposition. This is the product I want to go build. Here's a demo of it. So it could be a video that runs, uh, that shows what this product is about. And then there's a ask for, if you like what I want to go build, give me money. So it's the same idea there. So you can, you can deliver this offer in many different ways. It can be done with your customers face to face, or it can be done online. Um, it can be done um, in other ways as well. But the goal of this offer is not to go and again, promise the world. Because if you promise the customers everything, it's easy to go and, and promise people a lot of features. I can, I can go and ask how many people would like to, to uh, take a vacation on Mars or on the moon, and I might get a list of people interested who might even want to give me money but I can go build that. So you have to make sure that what you can build is not only technically feasible, but it can also fit within the smallest time frame possible. Because we want to accelerate that learning loop. We don't want to have that big middle where we are building a lot of stuff for a long time. So that's where this idea of the minimum viable product comes into play. So during these conversations, these negotiations with customers, you might start adding more features to your demo because that's how kind of scope creep comes in. But there needs to be the reverse process where you start to take things away. And you want to get to that minimal viable product, which is a, the smallest solution that you can build that also delivers customer value. So you don't want to compromise on the unique value proposition you're going to deliver to them. But also, you don't have to give them anything more than that. So this is how we, we, we try to limit the scope. And if you're launching a new product, I oftentimes see, and this is more in the kind of startup world, I see a lot of folks launching products and not charging for it because they don't want to ask for money. They feel like this is an alpha or a beta version. And I look at, I, I, I look at those things as cop-outs because if you are going to do the research and you're going to build this right product for your customer and you're delivering value to them, you should also go out and look to capture some of that value back, which is just a fancy way of saying you need to get paid for what you're, you're delivering. So it's not a, a one-way street. You have to deliver value and you have to get some of that back. Otherwise, you don't have a, a business model that works. So the next stage, after you've, after you've, built, after you've found the, the right product defined, uh, the next stage is to now go build this thing and then see if it's, if it's something that enough people want. Now, the important point of the second stage, the product market fit stage, <clears throat> is that we don't need lots and lots of users to, to test whether we have built something well. And you will see this again. Uh, when I start talking about features, and many of the bigger companies do this already, where they do stage rollouts. They will roll out to a small audience first, 
see if the product or feature really works, if it has the engagement, the effect they want, and then they'll roll it out to everyone. So you don't need lots of users to learn, you just need just a few good customers. If you're rolling out a new product to, a, to your B2B clients, you can do the same kind of thing. You can roll it out to a subset of people first, and if that product or feature works, you can then roll it out to more people beyond that. Now once you have that, that product working, we then shift gears and go into the final stage, which is the growth stage. And so this is where we have got a product that's starting to work, and we want to accelerate it. At this point, the focus begins to shift less about product and more about acquisition, customer acquisition, and referral type strategies. So let's talk, let, let's go down to kind of the more um, lower level and, and talk about how we, what, 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 is the, what is the product, what does this new product development cycle look like? So the first rule here is not to be a feature pusher. So all of us have ideas, all of us have backlogs that we just can't manage, and the answer is not to build everything and just push them out but really apply a more uh, customer-based feedback uh, learning approach to figure out what it is we should go build. And while we're building it, test whether it is the right thing that we're building. And once it's launched, we still want to do that kind of testing. So this is how we traditionally do uh, release planning. So it's some, someone who has the product development or product manager role will go and plan out the next year's worth of releases. So we say we've got all these features that in our backlog. We'll start to put them into these different buckets. So you have your release 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and we plan out the whole year. But, I'll, but all that is predicated on the fact that we actually know what the customers will really want. And so this is, in many ways, a dangerous place to be. The more lean approach is to go out with that idea of the minimum viable product as quickly as possible and give that in the hands, and put that in the hands of customers because that's where the real learning is going to start. That's where you're going to get people to start using your product and, and, the, and the rubber hits the road. From there, there's going to be customer pull, so they're going to either ask for more features or they're going to ask you to change certain things that aren't working quite right. And we use that feedback to then build and, or figure out what the next set of features or releases are going to be. So I use the word MVF for a minimum viable feature and MVP, MVR for a minimum viable release, which is just a collection of more than one feature. Now, the reason I said I, I'm, I'm going down to the feature level is if you are practicing, I, I know there was a workshop even yesterday on continuous delivery uh, and continuous deployment kind of is the same, same, in the same realm. But the idea there is that more and more companies are beginning to deliver individual features and even partial, partial features out and using feature flags to do some of those rollouts that I was talking about. So you can do partial rollouts, full rollouts. But if you are in that kind of a mode, nothing stops you from delivering individual features to individual customers and testing whether those work. And if they do, then delivering the rest to everyone else. So the big message here is one of going big on vision, but then going small on your, on your solution. So you don't want to have this massive roadmap that you're just executing for, for a year in the hopes that it's going to be the right feature set, but you want to go and test along the way. And remember, it's not enough to just get requirements from customers because customers don't really know what they want. Again, you have to figure out ways to understand what their underlying problems are and then build the right features and make sure they're using them. And if they aren't, you have to actually kill those features off. Otherwise, you're just going to create more waste in your system. So the second step in this, uh, in this, in this product development life cycle is that every one of your releases, and I call a release an experiment. I call every feature an experiment. But every one of your release has to end in customer learning. So this is the expanded build, measure, learn loop that Eric Ries codified almost maybe four years ago now. And so it starts out with an idea of something that you have. You go and build the product or you build an artifact of the product. It could be even a screenshot or a demo. It doesn't have to be the full product. But you put that in front of customers and you begin to get some data back. This can be either qualitative through customer conversations, usability tests. It could be quantitative through data analytics, uh, things like that. But all of that has to end in learning, and that learning has to be customer-based learning. So it's not enough to say we run an experiment, we build this great product, and you know, it, was, it was code complete and feature complete, and we have deployed it, so we are done. You actually have to end in customer learning, so you have to say we did all of that, and we actually learned that customers wanted, are using this product or not. So yeah, it has to end in that level of learning. So this is where I'll kind of bring this down to, I'm going to use a Kanban board to show a conceptual board that, that we started using, and then I'll end with a final board that you can learn more about later. That's a more updated board of, of, of this version. But this Kanban board was how we typically started um, tracking our features and our backlog. So we had a backlog, we had things in progress and done. A lot of you here should know what, you know what this is. 
the, we, we, we ended by adding a fourth column here. Or we started by adding a fourth column here, which was the learning column. So this is when a feature is built, we have to make sure that we actually learn something about customer behaviors, customer acceptance, customer usage. And so we added this fourth column as the first uh, next step here. The other thing that was very important was for us to build a continuous feedback loop during our product development cycle. So it wasn't enough just to gather requirements and launch something and then see if customers accepted it. We wanted to do something throughout the development cycle. So we went back to this board and we kind of added some more uh, states here, which I'll walk through in slow motion. So, it, so we'll, we'll go through each one in, in, in the steps. But these green areas are all the customer validation areas. So these are all the places while we are building a feature, we actually talk to customers. We either talk to them face to face or we measure something through data. Now when we, so, I'm, so what, what I'm gonna do now is actually work, walk through the process of how a feature would, would go through this process. So when we, when we take something off of the backlog, the first thing we wanna do is prioritize for a problem worth solving. So if you already have an existing product launched, we want to state what is our key metric. So this, this uh, kind of goes more into some innovation accounting stuff that I'm not going to talk about today. But sometimes if you are working with the product, the things that you are trying to improve might be revenue. The things you're trying to improve might be engagement. Uh, the things you're trying to improve might be activation. You may have a very low onboarding of, in, your, uh, in your process. So rather than trying to work on everything, you want to prioritize what are the right sets of metrics that you're trying to achieve. So the lean world is very, the lean startup world, I should say, is very metrics driven. And so we start by filtering out a lot of the backlog based on the key metrics that we're trying to, to improve. So that's the first filter that we apply. The second thing we do is we take things off the backlog and we want to really understand what's the underlying problem behind them. So oftentimes customers will ask for features, but you want to dig a bit deeper and say if they got that feature, what would that let them do? You know, what job is that really doing for them? Does it actually create business value? And if not, it may just be a nice to have feature. So we go through every feature and we kind of prioritize based on that particular job. And once we understand the, and sometimes this requires customer conversation. So sometimes you can do some analysis with yourself. And one of the techniques that we, we use a lot is a five whys root cause analysis. So why is a customer asking for a feature? And it might just be, you know, they want the print button. Well, why obviously to print stuff, but, but why do they want to print stuff? And we go through a layer of, of five whys trying to get to the real root cause, like what's the real reason behind their need, uh, their needing to print out this thing, which, you know, um, it, it's, 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 it's beyond just having it on a piece of paper. Like what's, what's the business case behind that? So by doing that kind of stuff, you can answer that question, but sometimes you have to actually go and validate that with customers. So you may ask them, just literally getting them on the phone and asking them, you know, what would this feature let you achieve? And then do five whys with them on the phone, but in a more casual manner, you don't want to, uh, uh, question them very, very aggressively for, you know, five, uh, five times. But at, at the end of that process, some of these features are going to be outright killed. So it may be that the problem is just a nice to have and not the most important thing to go into this release. And so it gets outright killed or it moves into the next stage, which, I, which is the demo or mock-up stage. And so over here, this is where I'm, I'm now kind of taking the ideas I shared early on at that macro level is that you don't really need code to test a vision. You don't need to build out your solution to test whether this feature is going to work. And so you can actually go out and build this mock-up of what you're going to go do and then get into this demo phase and show it to your customers. And so at this stage, you are again talking to your customers and showing them what their current reality looks like, where you're going to get them with this feature and see if you're solving the right problems. And that's what we want to test here. So the first stage was understanding the solution the second stage, the goal is to define the solution. Uh, sorry, the first stage was understanding the problem. The second stage here is to define the right solution for that problem. And to kind of illustrate that, I'll show you a product from, from one of our uh, portfolio. So we, have a, so we have a company that builds many products, but this is one of them in there. We wanted to take this screenshot, which is obviously a rainbow screenshot, very hard to see, very hard to understand. And we wanted to improve on this. And why do we want to improve on it? Because we wanted, this is a, this is a dashboard and we wanted to build a company-wide dashboard that anyone could really understand. And we went through this process of doing these mock-ups. So we didn't go and build any code. We didn't try to build this feature out because we had ideas of how to improve it. But we instead worked with our designer and our team, uh, the kind of the developers at first, to go through this process of just doing a, a bunch of series of, of mock-ups. And we then would 
ask whether we could actually implement each one of them. So we want to make sure that technical feasibility was possible because obviously designers can design things that cannot be easily implemented. So when you're doing any kind of new innovation, there are usually two leaps of faith. One of them is, can we build this? So that's the technical feasibility question. And the other leap of faith is, will customers actually use this? So will they buy it? Will they use it? Will they engage with it? And so we always start with technical feasibility, make sure we can build what we are going to go show customers. But then we do want to show it to them because we want to make sure we are building that right thing. Now the key point here is that this process took us days, not weeks or months. So we literally took days to build these mockups out. We had things that we could then go demo. And we started to put together some screenshots which looked very real. And so depending on your customers, sometimes you can show them things like wireframes, but we like to go and show them something that's pretty real looking. So this looks like a real web app. There's actually graphs and there is real data on here that we took from our own system. So we could actually tell a very compelling story. And we would then give them a demo and sh essentially tell them what this dashboard, what, what the goal is of this dashboard was. I'm not gonna get into those details, but the point is that we could walk them through this, a, a series of screenshots and show them how we solve a problem that, that they had asked us to solve. And then we would test for acceptance based on this. And once we had enough permission to do that, we would move on to the next step. Now this was an iterative process. We would go and show these to people and the initial dashboards were not as clear. They were actually quite confusing. And so we'd come back and just revise the mockups. So we were iterating on our product, but just through the mockup process and the, and the, and the demo process. Now once we get enough customers to say yes, if you actually build this thing, this is going to solve my problem, or I'm going to buy this even better, we then move on to the next stage, which is actually building this stuff out. So this is where I'm gonna go through a few states where we code this thing up. Um, and then we often will always do a partial rollout first. So this is where we don't roll out a feature to everyone. Now if you only have a few customers, you may just push things out to everyone. If you're starting out with a, in a, in a startup or if you have a few B2B customers, uh, and they all want this feature, you may just roll it out to everyone and then measure based on that. But in instances where you've got lots and lots of users and lots and lots of customers, doing a partial rollout makes a lot more sense because what we want to do here is make sure that, that, that we were actually able to build things that would, that would deliver value. So just showing someone a demo, uh, okay. So just, just um, showing someone a demo doesn't guarantee that the feature is actually going to work because we have just showed them a screenshot and we have showed them a story of how this will work once you actually build this thing out, you want to then go and make sure that there's actual, actual engagement with that, with that feature. And so this is the qualitative learning stage where I kind of stressed this one earlier. You don't need lots of users to learn. You can learn with just a few good customers. Now this stage is also has a, a feedback loop because we go and show this to a few customers and we have them use this feature and based on their usage, we either get data that is qualitative where they, where they tell us this is working, you know, we're actually using this. We can do usability tests. We can bring them into, our, depending on the product, of course, you can bring them into your offices and have them use that, that part of the product, give them a task. If you're building a travel website, have them book something with this, new, uh, this, with, with this new feature you've deployed. And you can measure whether it's actually working better than the baseline before. And that process itself is going to go back and forth. So you're going to go back and improve the feature and come back till you've got something that's working at that small scale. And then we go into the final stage, which is the full rollout. And even at this stage, it's not enough to just be done. So remember the done stage is um, once you've got this full rollout push, pushed out there, you have to verify that customers actually are using the feature and accepting it. Now that can take a long time. So because I kind of show this as a Kanban board, we, we do limit our, our uh, work, in, work in a progress queue. So we don't build all, so we're not building lots and lots of features at the same time we figure out how many features we can really handle. And as we're pushing them out, we are, uh, once things get into the done stage where they have done, they've, they've got that initial validation with customers, we then start working on the next set of features. But, but we still leave that feature out so we can measure whether it's being used because if a feature gets, if a if feature, feature gets accepted and the metrics validate that, then it stays alive. And in other cases, that may actually be killed off. So if the feature is deployed, but well, we find out that the early signals we got, it, it's rare for this to happen, but it does happen, where the early signals we got with the demo, with people using it, um, if it doesn't scale up, if people, you know, if, if, only a, if, a, if only a minority of people ask for this print function, but it doesn't get used by everyone, we may actually still go and kill that feature if it's just not the right feature to, to keep in that system. 
Okay, and so this is the more, uh, more recent version of that board. So I'm not going to walk through this one, but it has a lot more going on with it. Um, it still has a Kanban board in the middle, but it kind of moves up to a more macro level. So it talks more about experiments and it talks about how to run experiments in cross-functional teams. Um, it talks about doing metrics modeling and, 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 and starting to do some of that modeling that I had in the board uh, previously. You can also see how the last, so the last set of experiments went, so whether they passed or failed. So it has a lot more stuff in here. If you want to learn more, you can go to leanstack.com and look at that more updated board. The, the uh, feature Kanban board is also a blog post. If you kind of just search for how we build features um, and probably put my name, you'll, you'll find that, that blog post. All right, so I didn't want to spend a lot of time talking because I did want, I like to have more interactive type conversations with, with the audience. So I, I kind of open up for questions. If you guys have any questions, you can jump back to slides. I can get into any more detail of things you'd like to know. Yep. Sure. Is there a mic that we can, okay. But I'll repeat the question. The question was whether we have timelines, if I, if I understand right, for each of the stages. Like how long does the process take? Sure. Well, so I, I think in, in many ways it depends, it, it, it depends on the relationships you have with your customers. So we try to, we, you know, we, 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 we try to build our customers in, in the company that I run um, so that we can, we can set these conversations up very, very quickly. So if we were trying to come up with a new feature idea, it can literally take us days to get a, a mock-up done and, and customer validation on whether that mock-up's going to be accepted. And then, of course, the complexity of, the, of what we're trying to build is going to dictate how long it takes us to build that initial, uh, that, that initial minimum viable feature. And then we would go through that demo process. But that usually, we, we try to time box as much as, as so, when, so when I go into this particular board, when we look at our experiments that we run, we try to time box all our, all our work in two week in increments. So every two weeks we want to be having customer conversations. And that sounds very aggressive. For some people that's not feasible, but, in our, but it can be done. So uh, this looks all very linear and you know a happy path. Yeah. But very often, uh, what happens is uh, you 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 have a mock-up that people don't like. You build a demo that is not acceptable, a yeah. code that doesn't work, and uh, qualitative validation says that uh, it's not valid. So at every stage, uh, there's what we call as a possibility of a pivot. Yes. Right. And where we throw this whole thing out and start all over again. So uh, I don't think this captures that part. Well, so in, in some of these, in, let me take an example of uh, like this one. You know, there's, there's places to go back. So, so the idea here is that if you go through the demo stage, and it's not talking to just one customer, you're talking to a bunch of them, you have passed that gate, and now you move on to the validate qualitative stage. But if you're not getting the feedback that you, if you're not getting the right signals there, you are going back and reworking the product. No, uh, that, that we saw that. What okay. I'm saying is that at some stage you might need to throw the whole backlog out and start all over again. That, that's pivot. I mean, the idea itself is. Oh, uh, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. So I, I guess I, I was just want, just want to make the point that there is, and also the other thing is that any at any point in this feature life cycle, a feature can just be killed. I showed the killing at the end, but at, at any point, if you're not getting the right validation, even at that qualitative stage, you can you can abort that feature. But to your, to your point of um, if, if the backlog itself is wrong, so, so we don't usually work off that backlog. That backlog is really collecting things. That's where the lean canvas really comes into play. So if we do make a major pivot, so we, we go through this process and we are trying to improve, say, revenue, and we are just failing to do it consistently, there's another set of, um, there's, a, there's another cadence of progress reporting that we have that says, hey, this product is just not delivering on revenue we need to make that bigger pivot. So maybe we're going after the wrong customers. And yes, if that happens, you would change your canvas up. And you may come in here and, like you said, throw out stuff because now the, f the whole feature set, the whole requirement set just changes entirely. But the, but the idea of this is, th so this is more of that tactical feature level kind of dashboard. So, so provided your strategy is intact. So maybe just for the benefit of the audience, a pivot is really 
a change in strategy, and it's, it's not something that should happen weekly or biweekly. If it's happening that often, you're doing something wrong. Um, it, should be, it should be a major shift in your, in your focus. But when that pivot does happen, then obviously a lot of things are going to have to be thrown out and, and, and kind of aborted. Questions? Yeah. Sure, I'll, I'll repeat the questions, I, I could hear it. So how, how do you apply this to a legacy product? So I would say it's almost the same, um, so, it's, so this, that, it's a great question, because people always ask, you know, if you're starting afresh, it's easier, because you can, you can start and do all this all the validation. But even with the legacy product, I would say it's, it starts by baselining, and it does require more work, because you have to baseline the uses of your current product. So oftentimes, and I've been in this situation where before I started to apply these techniques, I had products with lots and lots of features. So you want to first baseline what's really getting used, the best way is to go also interview your paying customers and see either through data or through conversations what are they really using your product for. And there could be a whole bunch of stuff that you can just really like uh, essentially eliminate, you can, you can strip out. Um, you know, there are some startups that actually do more radical stuff where either accidentally you know, they, they, sh they, they, they take out features or sometimes intentionally they take out features and they see if anyone really, really complains. Now you cannot do that with every type of customer. But the point is that that would be step one, is trying to figure out what is really getting used and what's not getting used. Uh, and then f for me, it's as you start to add more things, you can then inject this process in. So it's, 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 it's scoping down and then trying to make that minimal feature set be a, a minimum viable release going forward. Yeah, question? Following question to that is uh, often the customer doesn't agree with the definition of the MVP that you have. Yeah. So how do you resol resolve that conflict? Sure. And, and, and could you uh, restate the first question again? Yeah, the first question is I wanted to understand how you can define the MVP as objectively as possible so that I'm mean, in some sort of guideline which is very objective and you could easily kind of put the MVP in that framework of sorts. Sure. So I, I guess for me, if, if, you're building, so if, you're, if you're building a visual product like this one, um, for me, the, the, the best functional spec is not you know, text or words. It's really trying to get down to that, that user flow, that user story, um, and really getting to that job the customer wants done. So if you can show them a demo and they get what you're trying to build, of course, they're going to be loose ends and they're going to be things that you have to, you have to come and supplement. But I find that to be, the, in, in many ways, the best kind of spec for your MVP. And the second question was when, when customers don't really uh, agree with your MVP, what do you do in those cases? Um, that's again where you have to dig deeper. So it's again, it's, it's that process of conversation. There are a lot of techniques out there. Some of you might be familiar with things like uh, things from innovation games where you can play games with your customers to try to have them pick their features based on some currency that they, they play with. Um, but you can, but, but, the, but the, the, the basic message there is that you want to get down to understanding why those features are really required and can they live without them because you're not essentially eliminating them. You're not, you're not telling them that we're not going to deliver this. The whole promise here is that we want to deliver stuff faster to you. And if you can get pretty sophisticated with this board, you can almost get to a point where you can predict your feature life cycle. So if you, know, if you go to Disney World, and that's the promise of Kanban, of course, but if you go to Disney World, you can tell how long the lines are just based on those markers. You can similarly go into a conversation with your customers and tell them how long features are going to take to get done and really have them prioritize. Would they rather wait three months to get these three things or can they get the one thing um, initially? So I, I think it is, it is a conversation that you have to have with your customers, but it gets down to that root cause analysis because many times customers will ask for things that they could really live, live without for a little while longer. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, they actually started with mock-ups because for them it was trying to change the culture and behavior of the society, right? So they won't go to customer and ask for a, what, what are your, your requirements, right? So yeah. if there are certain products like that, how do you go about? So I, I, I guess, can you repeat the, the first part? You said there were some products. If you could just repeat the question from the beginning. Sure. So there are some products like Facebook and WhatsApp, yeah. uh, which 
probably are, are this, the, the drivers to change the society, to change the behavior in the society, right? It's, it's not really that customer came with a problem. Yeah. Certain folks saw that there is a need for that and they started with, with that. So how, what do you do in those kind of cases? Do you really create mock-up and go to customers and say validate that? Right. So, so even in those instances, there, there, are, there is customer, there's lots and lots of customer feedback. So let's just take Facebook as an example. So I, I, I kind of previewed some of the ways they develop stuff, but when, when you know, they, so they, 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 they run in a very decentralized type of an organization and anyone in the team can really propose a new feature idea. So they have a vision for how they want to go build this and there's a goal behind it. We want to improve engagement or we want to go and build this feature and it's going to cause this to happen. So they write up some kind of a case with it. They, they go and build a team around it. And then they do go through a lot of this mock-up process where they are testing for usability. So they're not going and asking customers again. So I want to drive that, home, uh, that, that point home again, is that we never go and ask customers, what do you really want? What we want to really understand is what do they need by observing them or by interviewing them. So in a B2B context, you can go and interview people. And the best questions to ask there is not what should we go build, but you know, we're gonna, I would frame it as we're trying to solve this particular problem for you. And people would say, yes, you know, that's a big problem for us. And then you want to ask them, how do they solve that problem today? So it's not, telling, it's not having them tell you how you should solve it for them, but asking them how they solve it today. So by doing that, you understand their workflow, and then you can go back and come up with a much better solution. Now, in the cases where you go and build stuff, you can take Apple or you can take Facebook. In those cases, they have some intuition or some insight. And Steve Jobs was known for being a great observer. Um, he would obsessively go on these long walks and just stare at people and see how they were using things. And Apple even have, has, there's a new book called Inside Apple, and they talk about some of their design process. So they actually go and they, they actually follow people home. So if you buy an Apple computer at the store, they get permission to go to your home, uh, introduce themselves as some VP of product, and they go to your home and they, they watch you unbox the product and use it. But what they're trying to do there is learn through observation. They're trying to learn where are you getting stuck. And then they go back and design that right solution, which they then test. And then if it doesn't work as expected, they keep, keep going over it, uh, over that process. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you said is start with the riskiest component first. Uh, whereas we in the uh, Agile community talk about start with the components that you know mm -hmm. instead of building the whole blueprint and trying to figure out what you don't know perhaps the best. Uh, do you see a contrast in those two uh, uh, thinking paradigms? Yeah, so I, I, would, I would just say that, I mean, so I, I, I would say in, in, in going, back to the, you know, the, going back to the underlying failure rates, I would say that oftentimes the, 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 the root cause of failure is building that wrong product and starting with that, with that incorrect risk. So Eric Ries likes to tell this story, which I'll, I'll quickly tell. Um, he talks about spending six months of his life building code perfect, unit tested, you know, great, great software. And they learned that nobody wanted that software. And so at first he was very depressed because you know, he had to be kind of taken kicking and screaming because he spent six months of his life building this thing. He didn't want to throw it away. But then he convinced himself that, well, at least we learned something. At least because we built the software, we learned that nobody really wants it, so there was progress made. But then he realized that they could have learned the same thing without writing a single line of code. Because the reason that nobody wanted that software was something they tested right on the landing page. People were not even downloading the software. So that, in many ways, was the riskiest thing. So I would always just go back to, if we kind of, if we kind of had more time, I would go and show you the, like the customer life cycle of how they adopt stuff. But you have to first test customer demand or customer pull for your product. And that often is the riskiest thing to go test. If you can get over that, then by all means, you can start. You know, I, 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 won't, I won't comment on, on product development, so I, I keep that separate. I'm talking more about prioritizing what's riskiest in the, in the customer journey rather than what's in, that, in the product development path. Uh, we are only talking about building the features. Uh, how about uh, uh, purchasing or uh, uh, partnering with somebody? So the, uh, the question was, if, Partnering someone for what, sorry? Like instead of building uh, from the scratch, uh, if you find that uh, similar thing, what you want, or you, you know the first thing is what you really want, then the solution is if something is available ready-made, which you can customize. Sure, yeah, so, so if, if I understood the question is, if, 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 you, if you can uncover what people want and there's a solution already out there, can you just partner with someone instead of building it? 
Yeah, so by, by, by all means, I mean, if, if that fits into your business model. So one of the things we talk about, and there are lots of MVP techniques that do just that. So we, we use the more traditional MVP is what I showed here, which is you take your vision of your product and you scope it down. But we do a lot of really crazy stuff. So that's there's something called the Wizard of Oz MVP, which is just cobbling up stuff because we want to make sure uh, is there really customer demand for what it is that we're building? And if there's a faster way to go test that. So when Zappos, for example, launched, they didn't go out and build an e-commerce site. So Zappos is this online shoe store. They had this belief that an online shoe store experience was very poor. And by making the experience better, they could sell, they could build a much better brand. But they didn't go out and start building an e-commerce website and start stocking shoes. They literally went to other retail stores and took pictures of shoes, took, took high-end high pictures of uh, shoes put them on a website and started taking orders that way. And people would probably get freaked out and say, well, what happened next? Well, they just went and bought those shoes from those same retail stores and shipped them. So the goal here wasn't to really build everything out and see does it work, but they wanted to see if we actually did the riskiest stuff, which is we built this high-end experience, would people buy those particular shoes? And once they proved that out, they then had to scale their own solutions, so they had to build their own, their, their own products. So in your case, if it, if it makes sense to partner and you can make the business model work, that obviously makes sense. But if it's a way to f speed up learning, that obviously makes sense as well. Uh, the first stage is basically to you know, figure out the customer requirement. I mean, whether the customer needs it or not. Now, let's say, suppose you have figured out that there is a section of customer who needs this, really. Sure. And uh, you know, it's sort of verified learning, right? Now, the next stage is the viability piece, like whether you know, is it profitable? Is it like customers willing to pay for it? Uh, those kind of stuff. So things like WhatsApp, I mean, yeah. you know, there are like 450 million users, but you still don't know whether it is profitable or you know, things sure. like that. So what would you be, you know, your approach? Yeah, yeah, so, so I, I think that's a great question. So the way you describe it is the first stage is more about testing customer demand, and then you test about business model viability. Um, I would say in some products where your users are your customers, and you use WhatsApp, but if users are your customers, I, test, I like to test viability with the demand. So when I show that offer, if I'm going to a B2B customer, I wouldn't just show them a great product and say, you know, please use it, and if you feel it's, if I'm worthy of it, pay me. I'd much rather go and test pricing right on the spot to say, here's this product, we solved this problem for you, and once their heads are nodding and they're excited, I say this is going to be the price, and then there's going to be pushback and we're going to negotiate. So to me, that has to happen early, because price is one of the more riskier things in that business model. Now, in cases like WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, all those are business models where there's a derivative form of currency. So it's a multi-sided market. You have your customers who are paying for your product, uh, and those are advertisers. And then you have users that are creating value through either data or engagement. And so I look at them as a derivative currency. So there you're building this asset, and in the beginning it's worth nothing, because when you have 100 users today, that's worth nothing in those, in those uh, types of products. But once you have a certain tipping point, then you're worth a lot. So there you're building, almost think of it as currency. There's this exchange rate, and you're playing with that. The, the, the weird part with that is that exchange rate is, changes very rapidly. So last year, you know, 25 million was the big thing, and now it's, sorry, 25 million users was big. Now it's 250 million users, or whatever the number is. All right, thank you very much. I'll Hi, stick around uh, for a few sorry, more questions. Sorry, I have just one question. Uh, yeah. I think we're out of time, but if you want, I, I'll, I'll, I'll stick around. We can, we can talk for a few more minutes. Yeah, sure. Thank you.